go away. There we go. Um, so uh, I won't go through each of these in, in huge detail, but some things that you might want to consider when you uh, build an animal is uh, torque, which is the way that levers work. Uh, you know how when you push on a door to open it, it's easier to open the door if you push on the side with the knob on it. If you push on the side with the hinge on it, it takes a lot more force to get the door open. So uh, you can play with this, uh, making an animal uh, have a stronger motion or a weaker motion, depending on where the muscle attaches. So in a human arm, the muscle, your, your biceps muscle, attaches pretty close to the hinge, uh, which is your elbow. If you had an animal where the muscle attached further toward the wrist, it would have a much stronger lever. And uh, it would make this motion, uh, this sort of lifting up a barbell motion, a lot easier. I don't know why an animal would need to do that, but that's up to you. Um, this is why uh, you have animals that run like deer and dogs have this very long projection where our heel is off of the foot. And that is a lever that allows a muscle to attach. That's the, the Achilles tendon attaches there. Uh, and it makes a stronger uh, straightening motion. And when the animal- Daniel, I remember seeing that hinge sticking out on the hyrax. Ah, should we go back? Yes, here's that hinge on the hyrax, see? Uh, so imagine the hyrax has its legs bent and its uh, ankles flexed, and then it straightens all at once in a, in a burst of motion, and it, and it jumps. Uh, so notice also on its elbows, it has another hinge, it has another uh, lever like that. Uh, so, and, and on the deer, there's another lever like that on the elbow as well. And you'll notice that animals that run fast tend to have these very long uh, shins and long, what would be on a human, the, the bones of the hand and the foot. They're extended way out uh, to give the animal a, a stronger lever to push itself off the ground. Um, okay, another thing you can think about is stress. Uh, so you can calculate stress if you uh, think about the force acting on a bone, for example, versus the, uh, the area of the bone, if you, if you cut a cross section of it, the area of that circle uh, will, as the, as the bone gets thicker, the area gets larger and it can support more stress. And so, uh, if you, so here is the different kinds of stress that can act on a bone. Uh, you can have pressure, you can have tension, you can have shear stress, you can have, I don't know what the fancy word for this is, but it just breaks, and you can have uh, torsion or twisting. Uh, and these are all things that an animal might have to deal with, and the bone will be thicker or more, or are built with stronger walls in certain places. Usually the stress builds up on the joints, and you know you might know someone or you might have experienced this yourself. Uh, the other thing to think about is the square cube law. And we were talking about that earlier with heat. Um, if you imagine an animal as a box of skin filled with juice, uh, this is a very simple animal. Uh, imagine that this animal is one meter long. That means it has a surface area of one meter squared and a volume of one meter cubed. If it gets twice as long, its surface area becomes four times larger and its volume becomes eight times larger. And here on this graph, you can see how as length increases, area increases, but volume goes way up. And so after a while, you have an enormous amount of stuff inside the animal. You have, an, you have an, if you imagine an egg, uh, oxygen coming in from the air suddenly has a harder time getting into the center of the egg. If the egg is too big, oxygen can't get to the center. Uh, and so that's another reason that, that eggs can't get much bigger than this. Um, right, so I, I talked did, about... Did, did, yes? Daniel, do they speculate that that's the same for those huge 
dinosaurs we see? They couldn't get much bigger than what you just demonstrated? Yeah, yeah. So uh, Peter said the same thing. So dinosaur eggs, even the eggs of very giant sauropods, were only about this big. Uh, so, so imagine this, this huge creature the size of, of 10 elephants uh, as an adult, but as a baby, it hatches out of an egg this big. So it's the size of like a cat, uh, and it grows very, very quickly. So if our aliens mm -hmm. laid eggs, they mm -hmm. have to be appropriately sized. Perhaps, you, or, or you'd have to find some way of solving that problem. Perhaps the egg has lungs, which pull air into it. Uh, or perhaps the egg has, uh, it's in some kind of very high pressure uh, environment where the, the, the pressure of the air forces oxygen into the center. Uh, or maybe the shell is very wrinkly, which increases the surface area. Uh, what, what, if, what, if the parent, what if the parent animal's job was to break the shell rather than having the infant inside do it? So the infant gives some kind of signal and then the parent breaks the shell. Yeah. And I can imagine all sorts of interesting selective pressures there for intelligence because the parent has to be smart enough smart. to, to uh, devise a tool to tool. break the egg open. The or it could be very big and, and the parent has to be reliably close to the nest when the signal is given because yes. you know once once the once the uh, child is, is ready to hatch you know you, you've only got a limited window right yeah so. and, and there would be a whole culture that would you know develop around this kind of tension between the parent and birth yeah right i'm remembering i'm, I'm just imagining a large chicken the egg. Oh, sorry go ahead jacob i'm just imagining a large chicken I mean, it sits on the egg and anyhow. It has a beak, you know, a built-in tool. They're not that bright, though. So <laughs> right. You don't actually have to have a bright animal, just one that has behaviors that would support it. A sharp beak, yeah. right. So that's enough. <coughs> yeah. So uh, it could be, it would be an interesting thing of, uh, you know, a planet of animals with very sharp beaks, and there's the one poor mutant that has a crappy beak. And uh, it has a big brain. So it, it's a good story. Um, ah, the last thing I didn't talk about was uh, viscosity of air. Um, for us, air is a very thin substance. Um, but as if imagine shrinking down, uh, as the, the smaller you get, the thicker air seems to be. Um, and so like very small, uh, very small insects don't need to work very hard to fly. Um, very, very small insects don't even have proper wings. They just have these sort of feathery things on their backs and they just have to move them a little bit uh, to get enough force to lift them off the ground. Um, and even for something as small as a mouse, air is thick enough that if you drop a mouse from something that is very high from its perspective, it will be cushioned by the air and it won't hurt itself very much when it hits the ground. Um, if you drop an elephant from a much shorter distance, it will totally die. Uh, so that's another thing to think about. Elephants have to be very careful not to trip because even falling from their own height would seriously injure them. Okay, so any revisions to your giant mouse? Any new ideas? Or should I show you mine? I'll go ahead, Amber. Well, I wasn't thinking about revising the mouse itself. I was kind of happy with that. Yeah. But I was trying to think what you would do as defense for it. Okay. And um, it. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, you've got this this very large thing that has these huge teeth and this whip tail and all that. How do you defend from it? And um, I. I'm all about intelligent design personally. And so I just like designing things. Um, so I'm thinking you do some gene splicing and you come up with something that can fly, has a chameleon aspect to it to actually hide from the mouse and everything is built out of metal. Okay. <laughs> Solve those problems. Yeah. <laughs> um. There's the mouse defend mm -hmm. itself and well you know the how how does a mouse that size defends it defend itself yeah by being that size is the basic answer right so, so how do we defend ourselves against it we do gene <laughs> so we can fly because it can climb <laughs> this, is a, 
this is uh so you're you're more worried about the mouse than you are uh yes helping <laughs> in this scenario um uh, well isn't it true that um if you had large mice large mouse um you just want to be the smaller and more agile elephant <laughs> right so i the the opposite thing you could do is is scale an elephant down and see what it would look like uh so yeah. imagine longer thinner legs uh something more like a deer or a dog yeah and that trunk would have to either shorten or get out of the picture because you're going to trip on it <laughs> The, the other problem with the trunk is as you get smaller, you run into the opposite problem with heat. Uh, it's hard for small animals to stay warm. Uh, so uh, a big, long cylinder like that radiates a lot of heat. So it would have to be very furry and fluffy and shorter, or perhaps it wouldn't be there at all. Of course, and of course, if you're small and agile, you don't need a trunk because right. you're small and agile. Right. And so, I mean, we're, we're basically reverse engineering a hyrax. So here we are back at a hyrax, which doesn't have a trunk and is furry. I gotta go, folks. My group is starting to come in. Uh, it was okay. nice. It was here. Here. Yeah. Thank you. I'll mail you the, the presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, well, so Audrey, I'm sorry, avert your eyes, but uh, here's what I came up with. Don't know if you can see it very well like that. It's almost uh, cute. Thank you. Uh, so I, you can see a bit of my process here. So I started by just drawing a mouse. And then I was like, okay, it's something like an elephant. Is there anything I can do to make it more interesting? Because I always want to make it not just an elephant. It would be nice if it had some other features. Uh, and I thought, well, so its tail could be uh, what an elephant uses its trunk for. This thing could use its tail for. It could pick things up with its tail. Uh, and then uh, I forget who it was who had the tail be a weapon. Uh, perhaps it was Amber. Yeah. So then I thought about something like this, because that's a that's a real possibility for sauropods, especially things like Brontosaurus and Diplodocus and Apatosaurus that had uh, un very long and very thin tails at the tip. So the tail was about this thin at the tip, very very thin, and uh, paleontologists have simulated this and modeled it on computers, and they found that a tail that's very thick at the base and very thin at the tip would uh, might break the sound barrier when it's moving. Um, so it might work like a whip. And there are thoughts, some sauropods actually had big bony spiky balls at the ends of their tails, and so they certainly used them as weapons. Uh, the ones the ones with very thin tails might have also used their tails as weapons, or they might have just used them to make noise, because that would be helpful in communicating with other sauropods. Uh, so that whip tail thing is not a fantasy. Uh, 